When police respond to incidents involving firearms, the only way to play it is by the book. And this is where 911 calls come in, allowing officers to plan ahead. And what you hear? I hear a gunshot and I hear a female crying and screaming. I hear crying and screaming. But sometimes the very same calls can make a situation far worse than it needs to be. Hey, show me your hand! Show me your hand! Show me your hand! Get on the ground! Get on the ground now! Here are four 911 calls that left dispatchers speechless, starting with an abusive husband who might not be as dangerous as police were led to believe. It was December 1st, 2023 in Lansing, Michigan, when dispatch received an urgent call, a woman being abused by her husband on the 1600 block of Massachusetts Avenue. 911, what is the location of your emergency? Um, Massachusetts Avenue. Massachusetts Avenue? Yes, Lansing, in Michigan. Perfect, and on your name? Can you tell me exactly what happened? Uh, my, hum my husband's really drunk, and he just slapped me across my face, and he's just really super drunk, and he's getting violent. Okay. Did he have any weapons on him? Um, he did, but he uh, threw it in the car, so it's, I have it. What did he use or have? Um, he has a uh, gun. While the responding officers were on their way to the scene, another 911 call came in from a neighbor, and it appeared the situation had gotten much worse. Ingham County 911, what's the location of your emergency? Massachusetts. You said Massachusetts? Yes. And what'd you hear? I hear a gunshot, and I hear a female crying and screaming. I hear crying and screaming. How many gunshots did you hear? One. Massachusetts, additional units in command for information. Massachusetts have another caller who said they heard a single gunshot and now I hear a female crying. In the front room by the door, and I hear a female crying, the neighbors, and she just came out like 10 minutes ago and he was going crazy about his baby mama female who And then I hear her crying and screaming. So I don't know what's going on. I need to get over here, but I got my door closed because it's outside now. I don't know. Are they all outside? No. She outside too? She shot. Yeah, he shot her. I said he shot her. I'm at the front door, but my son was in the bathroom. And she's saying that he shot her. Priority update. Uh, sounds like the female has been shot. This is going to be a confirmed shooting. We'll get LFD and route. What do you see? What do you see? I don't see shit. I got my door closed. I don't want to get shot. The husband in question was Stephen, and as far as police know, he had shot his wife, Ashley, or at least fired a weapon, according to the neighbor. So when officers arrived on the scene, they were prepared for the worst. 34, go. Was that supposed to be in the driveway? As far as we know, she was out front. No one is over. We don't know a current location. Screaming. That's Steven in the driveway, and considering his situation, officers should be starting a series of de-escalation techniques. These include speaking calmly and with the right tone and use of words, ensuring your body language is relaxed and in control, making a connection and being empathetic with people, and getting the agitated person away from weapons and other people. It was only two years earlier that Michigan State voted to make de-escalation training a requirement, with retraining to be done on a yearly basis. However, what the officers would go on to do could be called anything but de-escalation. Show me your hand! Fine. Show me your hand! Get on the ground! Bro. Get on the ground now! Bro. Get on the ground! I will shoot you! Bro. Get on the ground now! Bro. Get on the ground! At this point, the body cam footage ends, and what you can't see is the two officers firing a total of 14 bullets at Steven, with six of them hitting the target. As Steven lifted his shirt, his firearm was visibly holstered on the side of his pants. However, there are many who argue that this was an attempt to let officers know that he was armed or that Steven was trying to disarm himself. Either way, public opinion states that he did not pose a direct threat. Unfortunately, this tragedy would have been completely avoidable if dispatchers had informed officers about a third 911 call that they received, this time from Ashley's children. 911, what is the location of your emergency? Um, Jesus Avenue. Is this no, this is my daughter. What's going on? Are you, is she hurt? <laughs> yes, my stepdad slapped her. Um, we can hear more. Did you shoot her? 
No, but you shot a gun to scare her. This call was received the moment officers arrived on the scene. While the dispatcher attempted to ensure the children's safety, he never told officers that Stephen had never even shot his wife. This crucial piece of information could have easily saved his life and made a difference between these kids having a father or not. Tragically, Stephen wouldn't survive this ordeal. To make things worse, the majority of the footage released by police has been heavily edited and doesn't show what really happened. Stephen's family claims he was confused by the conflicting orders of the officers and was wrongfully killed. They filed a lawsuit against Lansing police for $100 million in a case that has yet to be resolved as of December 2023. Fortunately though, this next case did reach its end and showed us just how devastating a simple mistake can be. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh, was it trying to do that? Was it saying I can't breathe correctly because... 23 uh, uh. year old Elijah was an introvert minding his own business while walking home from a store on August 24th, 2019. That was until someone who had taken a disliking to him called the cops, resulting in him being confronted by officers. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. So there's a, so there's a guy, he has a, he's walking to the opposite, what's the opposite of Mark? South. South. South, yeah, he's walking south on Billy Street. He has a mask on. Okay. And then, and then when I pass by him, he puts he puts his hands up and does all these kinds of signs. I don't know. He, he looks good to you. I mean, he might be okay. a good person or a bad person. Yeah. Right now, he's like, I'm, okay. I just turn around and he's like putting his hands up. Okay. Don't approach him, okay? If you need to, just drive away. I don't want you to go near him. Were any weapons involved or mentioned? No. Okay. I already have a call in, okay? I need to get his full description. What race is he? I think he's a, a black male. Okay. Um, how old does he look? I know he's wearing a mask. I have no clue. Okay. What color is the mask or what does it look like? Black. Black mask? Is it like a ski mask or what type of mask is it? Yeah, like a ski mask. Okay. And then what else is he wearing? Uh, I don't know. He's pretty bad like a put down long suit shirt. Or, okay. And then black sweats. Wet pants. Okay, um, give me one moment. I'm just adding notes. Are you or anyone else in danger right now? No. Elijah was wearing a ski mask because he suffered from poor circulation and had to wear extra clothing to remain warm. Police could have easily found this out if they had asked. Instead, they went in heavy handed and it didn't take long for the scene to turn ugly. Do a favor, stop right there. Hey, stop right there. Stop. 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 I have a right to stop you because you're being suspicious. Well, okay. Turn around. No, Turn around. Hands, Turn around. Stop. Stop, stop tensing up, dude. Stop, stop tensing up, bro. bro. Let go of me. Stop me. tensing up. No, well. no, I am an introvert. Please stop respect the up. boundaries that I am to. speaking. Stop relax. tensing up. Stop. Relax. Stop. I'm going home. Relax or I'm going to have to leave change this alone. situation. Dude, hey, leave stop. Relax. Alone. Sir, can you please? No, we don't want to do this, all right? Leave me alone. No, we're going to First off, you guys started to arrest me and I was stopping my music to listen. Now let go of me. Get over the. Let's get over the grass. Okay. We're gonna lay you down. Okay. Come on. Give us more. Give us some more. We're fighting them. Stop, dude. You got him. Stop, dude. Right, we got his arms. We got his arms. You want them? Yep. We got his arms. Okay. Dude, just stop fighting. Taser, taser, taser in a second. You're gonna get tased in a second. Stop fighting. Stop fighting, you're gonna get paid. The officers claim that Elijah reached for one of their guns, but this was never seen on the body cam footage. What's more worrying is that each of the three officers who were at the scene claimed their body cams fell off in the struggle, which is not impossible, but seems extremely convenient. Uh, I don't know, so stop. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to do that. I, just, I, I can't breathe correctly because... Uh, uh. Move your camera, dude. Uh. No, he went for his gun. Oh, oh my God. You might have missed it, but one of the cops holding Elijah down just told his colleague to leave his camera. This leads us to one question. If the officers really thought he broke the law, why try to tamper with the footage? Additionally, you can hear Elijah saying he can't breathe properly, and that's because the officer has applied a cardioid control hold, which is used to cut off blood flow to the brain by compressing the cardioid arteries in the neck. This can render a person unconscious, just like in the case of Elijah. Gotta throw up, dude? Yeah. Throw up right there, okay? Don't throw up on me, though. And I don't think he went out, dude. He was he like halfway, I think. But hey, dude, relax. I think he's trying to pee. Oh, uh, okay. Get it out, dude. Anything? No, he was. We got called to a, sus a suspo. He was out here walking around with a ski mask mm -hmm. on, and then uh, we contacted him. Green. Have, uh, he's wearing a ski mask. The RP and we got that covered. He started to kind of like walk yeah. away from us. So these two wrap him up, and then in the midst of them wrapping him up, pushing him against the wall right here, yeah. he reached for Rosie's gun, dude. So. Oh, fuck. 
Don't Scared get up, dude. It's not gonna be good for you. I'm telling you right now. Dude, if you keep messing around, I'm gonna burn my dog out. He's gonna dog bite you. You understand me? Keep messing around. That's one of the officers threatening to let his police dog loose on Elijah. As more officers arrive, another officer gives his alibi. However, there would be a huge discrepancy between his words and what body cameras just recorded. Don't do it, dude. Relax, bro. Come Chill on. Out. You already lost this one. Just relax. No, no. When we tried to stop him, he... But he's, he's definitely doing something. Ow. Okay, okay. Stop, dude. Well, well, chill out. You've already been told several times to stop. I can't fix myself. Ow. Yeah, it's suspicious call over here on building. Dude, chill uh, out. He's got a mask on his face. That's kind of weird. Nothing really criminal. My officers go to make contact with him. He starts acting crazy. And, uh, they put uh, the uh, him on and he attacked him. Uh, please. And actually well, stop the, fighting us. Stop fighting us. I tried. They put him out. They were able to get him out of handcuffs. We're still struggling with him. Yes. I have and that's where we're at. I just want to let you know, okay, yeah, we did that game quite a lot tonight, so. Okay. Just one other thing, we did have an officer get... Uh, yeah, that's all his, dude. That's what he was wearing. Okay. It was huge. Okay. It was very minor. Whatever he's okay. on, all right. yeah. he has incredible strength. Yeah, crazy strength. I had him in a bar hammer behind his back, yeah. and his arm was above his head, and he was still fighting. Oh. So he's walking away from us, and... He, he did this thing, we're like, hey dude, this is not a big deal, just relax, and we, we sat there for a good 30 seconds just trying to calm down, we're like, dude, hey, not a big deal, we just, we need to talk to you. He kept doing this, and he kept saying things that didn't make any sense. I try, I'm like, hey, bring him over the grass, so if we do have to take him down, we can take him down the grass, not by, because we're right here by the rocks, um, and then he starts going even crazier, so we get him cornered against the wall. What's he doing when he's acting crazy? He's, he's like saying stuff, and he's holding his arms in, and he's like, I, I, I don't remember exactly what he was saying right now, but just acting really strange. Randy, you need relief, buddy? Randy, you need relief? No, I'm good. I'm just going to pat him down. Make sure and then over there, Rody tells me to try to grab my gun. So we pull him down. What, while he's... While you're... Yeah, so he pulls his arm free and comes out. And um, I don't remember feeling it because I was focused on him. But he said, like, you're trying to grab a gun. So I'm like, okay. So he comes down and... No. no. He just thought it was weird because he was wearing the mask. I initially tried. And then his... I was in a bad position. I didn't want to hurt his neck, so I had to release because I was behind. I wasn't like so you went to you went to put it on. So it was more it was like a almost like a schoolboy trying to get a putter backwards wow, okay. because that was the only position I had. And then sure he can breathe. He can, breathe. Side. he can breathe. Okay, just, all right. I just have his arm pinned behind his back. While he was being restrained, Elijah lost consciousness, and paramedics gave him 500 milligrams shot of ketamine. But the recommended amount for a patient of this size and body mass is only 320 milligrams. They estimated his weight at 220 pounds when he was in fact only 140. He never recovered from this use of excessive force, and three days after this incident, his life support machine was turned off. Two of the officers involved were acquitted of any charges, while the third was found guilty of criminally negligent homicide and third degree assault and is due to be sentenced in January 2024. The two paramedics argued they were only following their training but were found guilty of criminally negligent homicide and will also be sentenced in 2024. Giving out the wrong information during a 911 call can be disastrous, so imagine doing it on purpose and putting thousands of lives at risk. And you said this was at, shoot, they were threatening to shoot up OU? Yeah, they, the, the, the University of OU. Yes, correct. Over the Easter weekend of 2023, the University of Oklahoma fell victim to several swatting calls that left the entire campus gripped in fear. However, not all SWAT calls are meant to be genuine. Fake reports of terrorists and criminals have become increasingly common in the U.S. and can have terrifying consequences like causing mass panic. This is one of the main aims of these twisted fake SWAT calls. Norman Communications. Yes, hello. I just got home from work and my son has left me a note here saying, Dad, I love you, but I have to go to the university university and shoot everybody then all my guns are gone and everything's just like messing here in the house okay uh what's your location i'm in my car right now currently i'm i don't know if i should go to the school and try to stop them or what to do here okay uh when you got the message from them where were you at i was i was in my car i got it over messages i don't know if he's in the school at the moment or what to do here and you said this was at shoot, they were threatening to shoot up ou yeah they then the, the University of Oakland, yes, correct. Okay. And that's how swatting calls work. You can probably tell that the call seemed a little off, but the caller very carefully avoiding the question of his location. And there's good reason for this. He's not even in Oklahoma. In fact, he's not even in the United States. As the call continues, he cleverly feeds the dispatcher the information he knows will cause the most direct response. Him and his friend. Do they live here in Norman? Yes. 
Do you know the address they live at? No, I don't. And my two AR-15s are gone, and my handguns are gone as well, and all the ammunition, everything is just gone. And then more hoax calls start to come in. He's six foot tall, around six foot tall. Black coat and AR-15. These fake calls wouldn't end there, though, with callers even adding in special effects for extra realism. He's heading towards the libraries right now. When students caught sight of the SWAT team surrounding the campus, even more 911 calls started to come in, and this time, they were real. As mass panic begins to settle in, the situation starts becoming way too real. Physical science building with like 10 other girls. We've been taking shelter. My daughter has texted me. She is in hiding with several of her friends. Thankfully, nobody was hurt, but the hoax callers got what they wanted, and the FBI are still investigating the case as of December 2023. Sadly, this next shooter was very real and his story would only end in bloodshed. It started off as a welfare call from a concerned neighbor. I was just approached by an elderly gentleman uh, right outside of my apartment. Felt pretty threatening. Told me that, that he knows me and I'm going to prison. Uh, I told him I don't know him and he went hey, like scuffled back into his apartment. I don't, I, I, I don't know if it's like a wellness check. I'm not trying to get shot by the old man. Hi, uh, I'm Ken. So are you wanting phone to go check on him? Are you okay? Uh, yeah, that, that would be good. I don't really feel like dealing with this, but I also don't want to, like I said, get right. gunned down. He was talking about his neighbor, Richard, who had been acting pretty strange. But in an even stranger turn of events, Richard would go on to call 911 himself. The dispatcher had to make sure the scene was safe for the approaching officers. All police know is that someone has complained about a confrontation with his neighbor and that the very same neighbor has also called 911 to report their phone being hacked. With all this information, officers know that the suspect is armed. Unluckily though, they have no idea what they're about to walk into. Tell you it's us. 
That's our dispatch. Richard has just asked the officers to bring their patrol car around to the front and park it under his window since he's threatened to shoot them. That's not going to happen as they will be putting themselves directly in his line of sight. But it's what one of the officers heard from behind the door that concerned him the most. The sound of a round of ammunition being loaded into the barrel of a gun. The cops back off and Richards decides to call 911 again. This is where things really start to get out of control. Uh, there's somebody come in my door. They said they were the police. I know they're not the police. And he's officer is down. Hey, is this Richard? Yeah. Okay, the police yeah. are outside. They're at your door. They're in. I don't see him. I want to see the car. I want to see the lights on. Richard, Richard. So I want to see the lights. Blue lights on. When I see the blue lights, I will drop the gun. And he took me in or whatever. Richard, listen, okay? No. Goodbye, goodbye. You're done, cop. County 911, what is the address of your emergency? I hope you're police this time. They've been there since my call is back. And uh, tell them when they pull up to put on the lights so I know it's the police. They're trying to come stay out the door. They're trying to what? Life and death matter. So we get shot. Another 911 call came in from a different neighbor claiming they heard two gunshots. EMTs and crisis negotiators were sent to help, but Richard had other ideas and seemed utterly convinced that the police weren't actually police and were there to kill him. That might explain what he did next. Can you see that door from where you're at? The window that's open with the chain. Hey, can you see anything? What'd you say, Hodge? Yeah, I'm gonna go to you, okay? Okay, cool. He is, he is, uh, he is, he is cover, okay? Okay. With officers under fire, the situation is becoming dangerous, and it's not just the lives of the police officers that are at risk, as there are terrified residents in the surrounding buildings and an evacuation is impossible. A team is sent in to make contact, and although they are armed, they are using non-lethal weapons to subdue the suspect. In this case, this includes the use of dogs, tasers, and a shotgun armed with bean bags that can put a suspect out of action without causing any serious harm. However, before officers even get their chance to use these, Richard makes another 911 call. You want that? You want to take shoes now? Want as a crazy white guy? It's crazy white buffalo. Come on, buddy. Can you hear me? I need you to listen to me, Richard. When Richard called earlier in the night, he said he was a war veteran, and it sounds like he's having a serious mental health issue. Some of his neighbors spoke of strange encounters with him and suspected he might be suffering from some form of PTSD. This could be the reason the police are handling the incident with less lethal weapons, but this decision was made while Richard was firing a handgun and had little range. Now he's been spotted with a rifle is becoming an even bigger danger. Because of this, SWAT is left with no choice but to take drastic action. This was the sound of a shot being fired into the broken window of Richard's apartment after the decision was made to take down the suspect. However, it is difficult to get a visual on the suspect's state, and it is unknown whether Richard is dead or alive at this point. Richard Glass, Jeffersonville Police, if you can hear me, acknowledge me. Don't come out the door with any weapons. Richard Glass, if you can hear me, acknowledge this command. Richard Glass, Jeffersonville Police. If you can hear me, call out. We want to get you medical help. We're here to help you. When they do gain entry, they find the SWAT team had hit the target and Richard was dead. Indiana State Police are still investigating the case, but Jefferson Police defend their use of deadly force.